So our topic today is, is the Bible trustworthy? And, and uh, this comes out of not just the question that, that I got, but also um, we've kind of bounced on this topic uh, in various lessons in the past couple of months. It is um, what's written in the Bible really something that we can rely on? Is it something that we know can be uh, trusted? And um, there are lots of people out in the world who try to find all sorts of reasons why the Bible isn't trustworthy. And, uh, and so we must not ever let them shake our confidence, but it's important to have a foundation to understand both the kind of attacks that they make on the Bible and what our response is, what the truth is on, on that. And so that's what we're gonna to do today. And I suspect next week, we're gonna continue on with a different uh, shade of this same topic. So this all came out of, as I said, an anonymous question, plus the kind of things we've been running into in the past couple of months. And, and so this anonymous question comes out of a verse from Job. And, 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 and leading up to this verse, Job has been complaining that God is unfair to him. And we, we know Job's story. Uh, Job really had it bad. He lost pretty much everything and he was suffering physically. And, and so uh, he's been complaining to God that God is unfair and he wishes that he had somebody who could go and talk to God in his place and, and represent him and, and show God that how God has been uh, unfair to Job. And, and God responds in Job 9.9. 9. And, and his response, um, I'll, I'll read, but, but we just need to understand the point of all of this is God is saying, who are you to question me? Who are you to tell me that I'm not fair? And, and so uh, Job, uh, Job is given a list by God of all the different things that God has done, great, amazing things. And, and he says, I am the person who did all of these amazing things. Who are you uh, to question me? And so Job 9.9 9 says, who makes Arcturus, Orion, and the Pleiades, and the constellations of the south? And, and so the question that the anonymous uh, person asked was, um, how are these uh, constellations and stars named before it was known they existed? And, and so I'm gonna answer a question that's really similar, but not exactly identical to that. And, and I'm gonna restate the question as, wasn't Job written long before they were identified and, and also before they were named? And, and so that's really the question here. Now, now I'm the, the anonymous questioner is not doubting the Bible. They just would like to understand how all of this happens and, and how it all makes sense. Uh, but there are people who use this as, as a source of um, criticism against the Bible. And so we're gonna learn what the answer is here. And we're gonna learn a surprising thing from this as, as we go through it too. Um, uh, God is really telling something to us in our time, not to Job, because Job couldn't have understood it, but to us in our time, he's told us something. And, and so the, the question really is, um, wasn't Job written long before these constellations were identified and named? And I'm gonna bring in another verse from Job that has these same references in that, and that comes later from Job 38, 31, and 32. And God, and it's the same story again, Job is still complaining that God is unfair to him. And, and uh, God's answer is pretty much the same as before. Are you the one who did all of these things? And, and so what he, it says in Job 38, 31, 32 is, can you tie up the chains of the Pleiades or undie, untie the cords of Orion? Now, I'll just explain a moment. Probably you don't know Pleiades. Maybe some of you do. Where's my pointer? Okay, Pleiades. Um, that is um, a word that means um, the seven sisters and, and uh, it comes from Greek mythology. And um, the other one is Orion, which also comes from Greek mythology. And, and so uh, that's kind of part of the question of how did we get these names uh, for the, those constellations? And, and so uh, God says something interesting about each one. He says, can you tie up the chains of the Pleiades? Well, do the Pleiades have chains? Or untie the cords of Orion? Well, Orion has a belt. Um, is that what we're talking about here? And then he continues on and he asks the question, can you bring out a constellation in its season and guide Arcturus with, your, with her satellites? Okay, and Arcturus is a single star and we'll talk about that later. But, but God asks some very specific questions here that are gonna turn out to have very interesting answers. And so, as I said before, these names, Orion and the Pleiades, comes from Greek mythology. Um, Orion is, is a name that was first mentioned by Homer. That's very early Greek but it, it still is after Job. And, and so the name Orion didn't exist in Job's time. And so um, to understand this, I'm gonna ask you a question here, uh, of a ver not a verbal question, but a physical uh, visual question. What is this? And, and most people will see that and say, oh, that's a box made out of dots. And, and the reason we answer that way is because that's the way our vision system works. 
um, our, our eyes and our brain together are extremely good at taking little bits and pieces of information and putting them all together into a whole. And so that's how we take all the eyes and the nose and the mouth and put those together into a face along with the hair. And, and we understand that to be a face. It's not just uh, eyes and ears and, and stuff. It's a face that contains all of these things. And, and that same ability that, that makes it uh, wonderful, for us, wonderful for us to see and understand what we see can also be confused. And this is an example of this. Your eyes uh, will probably look at this and, and say, well, that's a box. But it's actually being tricked. It's not a box. It's just four dots. But, but your eyes have said, okay, these four dots are in a really regular pattern. They look like a box. And, and so it, it's just natural for our vision system to do that. And, and this is very much the same as uh, when we look up in the clouds. Sometimes maybe as a kid, you laid on your back looking up at the clouds and you said, well, that one looks like a horse and that one looks like the tree or something else. And, and it's the same visual ability that we have that, that our eyes take these shapes and put them together into meaningful ways. And, and so what's normally a really good thing for us is kind of being tricked into seeing things that don't exist. And, and, uh, and so that's how all of these constellations came to be recognized is through this natural ability of our eyes. And so we, if we were looking up in the star, star, starry sky and we saw these four stars like this, we would say, oh, that looks like a box. And so we would call that the constellation box. And so we would give it a name. And, and so in whatever language we were speaking, we would, we would note that these four stars are together and they, they kind of make sense together and we would give them a name. So, so now we go back to the, one of the real questions here is how did we get all these constellations and all of their names? Where did all of that come from? And it turns out that many of the constellations, not all of them, but many of them were identified long, long before Job. Uh, we don't, so far back that we don't have records of, of that. Um, the Sumerians are the first people who start mentioning, mentioning constellations in their writings because they're pretty much the first people who wrote anything and they wrote on clay tablets. Um, and, and so we understand that it happened even before the Sumerians and it may have gone back as far as Adam. It might be that Adam in his 900 years of existence must have looked up in the sky and said, well, look at those, you know, that one kind of looks like a man and that one kind of looks like a bear and, and uh, did those sort of things that anybody would naturally do with their human vision. And, and uh, somehow they came to agree uh, between them on these constellations and they found that useful. They said, these constellations appear in our winter and they don't so much appear in our summer and, and they, that helped them understand the sky and the seasons. And that was what God put them there for. Um, uh, the, the Bible in Genesis says exactly that. The stars are there to, to uh, help us figure out seasonal things. And, and so um, these Sumerians, that, who are the first ones to describe constellations, um, were the descendants of Noah by Ham. Uh, they did, they, and they came pretty quickly after the flood, like about 300 years or something like that after the flood, here's the Sumerians and they're writing on clay tablets. And, and, um, and so by their time, the Sumerians time, they had figured out uh, that, well, somebody, I don't know if it was them, but somebody before them had figured out that these stars together looked like a hunter. The, the guy had shoulders and a belt and, and stuff like that. And, and so he must have been a hunter. And, and another group of them, there were uh, these seven stars that were all kind of close together and similar brightness. And those must have been seven sisters, they decided. And, and so they made up these groups. And these identifications of the stars, these groupings of the stars that they made, were passed on to all of the other people who came from the, the Sumerians. And Sumerians were among the first peoples, but not the very first people. The Sumerians actually come after the, the big split in languages at the Tower of Babel. And, and so many many of the people who um, are alive today have ancestry that goes back to those Sumerians. And, and as I said, they may have been named before that. Probably, I'm quite certain, but I have no proof that Noah knew a lot of these names of the constellations himself. So anybody who came from Noah, which is everybody, uh, would have known some of these constellations and, and would have passed that, that on to the people that came after them. So these identifications were passed on. And I said, not, not all of them uh, were identified, but it seems like quite a large number of them were known at least to the Sumerians by their time. So uh, these identifications passed on to other people and they got eventually to the Greeks and, and the Greeks uh, went ahead and created a, a backstory based on their multi-theistic uh, culture. And, and they decided that this wasn't just a hunter, he was the hunter called Orion, who was somebody special in their mythology. 
And, and similarly, they created a backstory for these sister stars and, and called them the Pleiades and, and the whole story behind how they came to be up in the sky. And, and so the Greek did all of these things, uh, fitting them into their, their culture. Other groups did the same thing. Uh, they, they knew the patterns of the stars, but they gave them names in their own uh, languages. And they also gave them, in some cases at least, gave them backstories, gave them how they came to be and explain explanations for them. And so we here in English have inherited many of the Greek names. Uh, I don't know exactly why that is, but if you look at the Old Testament Hebrew, you'll see that the Old Testament Hebrew has Hebrew names for what we just read in Job. Um, but in the English translation of that, you see Greek names. Uh, you don't see the Hebrew names uh, translated into English. You see Greek names. And, and so um, we somehow got the, to use the Greek names in our culture, and that's what everybody in, in our culture knows them by. And so that's kind of how, how all the constellations were identified, at least most of them were identified, and why we have kind of a common base for a lot of those. So when you're translating things, there's something that you, you have to do. Um, if you have uh, two people who want to learn how to communicate with each other, they speak different languages and they're trying to figure out each other's in that language. When they see an object and they, they want to figure out the name for it in the other guy's language, the first guy will say, you'll point to the horse and you'll say, horse. And the other guy will say, oh, he's pointing to the horse, and so he's telling me what the name of the horse is. And then he will, on his end, say, point to the horse and say, caballo. And, and uh, so the other guy who was at the start of it over here says, ah, okay, that's his word for horse, and he has my word for horse. And so that's how you normally do translations. You, you take a, a physical object and figure out what both people call it. It isn't so easy for a lot of things, though. Uh, a lot of things are um, abstract concepts that are, are uh, hard to explain. You can't point to an abstract concept. So in, in translation isn't always as easy as this. And even with stars which are physical and not abstract, it can be harder with those constellations. And, and But because of the early identification of a lot of those constellations, like probably before Noah's time, most cultures mostly recognize the same constellations up in the sky. And, and so if, if they look up there, they see those stars and they say that's those stars together look like something and everybody agrees what it looks like on or, or pretty much everybody agrees. And, and so that's a normal translation. A, a person can point up in the sky, maybe he on, his, on the ground will scribble out the stars that he sees and the pattern that he sees in those stars. And the other person will say, yeah, OK, I know those. And, and this is our name for that constellation. And, and uh, so it's a normal translation when you do that. One person identifies the constellation and they exchange the names by pointing to it and, and pointing up in the sky probably. So that's how the constellations get, uh, get translated uh, and translations is definitely part of what we're dealing with here. But sometimes the constellations are different between cultures. As I said before, not all of the constellations were identified by the Sumerians or probably even by Noah. And, and since that um, people have pretty much constellationized the whole night sky. And uh, pretty much every star has a constellation that it's in or part of. And, and because of that though, because a lot of them identified them in their own culture, they have different symbols for some of the stars. They don't have the same constellations. So one person's constellation wouldn't be the same for the same stars that another group would have. And so when you run into that problem, you, you, it's untranslatable. There, there isn't an equivalent that you can translate it to. And we see that, this is going back to Job 9.9 finally, we see that in Job 9.9, the part that I've marked in yellow there, you'll see translated in a whole bunch of different ways. And the reason is people can't understand what's being said there. More than likely, given the context here, it, it's God speaking and he says, who makes the bear, Orion, and the Pleiades, and something else? And, and he's probably naming a constellation that we have no constellation for. So it can't even be translated and we don't even know what it is. Um, and, and so translators are, are messing around trying to make as much sense of it as they can, but they come up with different ideas of how to translate it. So no one is talking about it and, and we don't know exactly what's being said there. So we're gonna deal just with the bear, Orion and the Pleiades and, and that whatever that was that comes at the end of that verse and it's also in the, the verse, chapter 38 verse as well, um, that constellations to the south or whatever is being said there um, is um, something we're just not going to deal with because we can't. We don't know what it's talking about. Okay, now going back to what I said before, God says some interesting things about these constellations. Did anyone have a question there? Okay, um, so he asked some odd questions of Job about these. He says, 
can you tie up the chains of the Pleiades, that's the seven sisters, or untie the cords of Orion, that's the hunter? Um, can you bring out a constellation in its season? Now that's referring to that other thing, that other constellation that we, we don't know, the one that was mentioned, uh, just, I just mentioned. And so we're not gonna deal with that part, but he asks about, can you guide Arcturus with her satellites? Now that's, all those are very interesting questions. Does Pleiades have chains? Can you undo the cords of Orion? And so God uh, to Job is using names that Job would have known and understood, but we don't for one of them, but three of them we do understand. And so God sees the Pleiades, the seven sisters star constellation as being chained together. And that's an interesting thought. Um, I have a quote here from um, a, a source that, uh, on stars and especially stars in the Bible. And, and he says, the Seven Sisters is what's called an open star cluster in the constellation of Taurus, a group of hundreds of stars formed from the same cosmic cloud, but there are these seven that stand out. And th these seven are all bound together by mutual gravitation. They're all part of the same cosmic cloud. The same gravity is holding all of them together. So the they are bound together by gravity. So what, what God says there is kind of interesting. He says he knows that these are chained together. More than that, he says, I'm the one who chained them together. So uh, that's the Pleiades. And he says about Orion's belt, uh, can you untie it? Well, Orion's belt is formed from two different stars and one star cluster. And they have names that you don't care. Um, and, and what's happening with these stars is these stars are all not chained together. They are heading in different directions. If we waited a million years, Orion's belt would disappear because those stars are all heading off in different directions. And, and so it's interesting here that God has, has described Orion's belt as being untied. And, and, and in reality, they are. They're not gravitationally coupled together. And, and the last one, which is really particularly interesting, is uh, can you guide Arcturus with her satellites? Now, Arcturus is uh, one really big, bright star. It's bright um, for two reasons. It's bright because it's big, and it's bright because it's not that far away from us as stars go. So. But what's interesting is God sees Arcturus as having satellites. And, and um, here's that uh, same person that I quoted earlier, a quote from him again. And he says, one of the brightest stars in the Milky Way. While Arcturus certainly appeared in antiquity to be a single star, in 1971, astronomers discovered that there were 52 additional stars connected directly with Arcturus. So they, directionally with Arcturus. So they're all, as we see them, almost directly in a line with Arcturus. So when we see Arcturus, it's hard to see the ones who in our time are just a little bit to its side now, but, but way back you had no hope, you didn't have the optics to, to do it and, and they were much better in line than they are now. So there are these satellites that were hidden until relatively recent and we couldn't see them without the good optics that we now have in our telescopes. And, and so there were these 52 additional stars all in a line, but the line is lined up with us, so we, it's difficult for us to see them. And, and so continuing on with the description is Arcturus is one of the largest suns in the universe. It is 25 times the sun's diameter, which means it's also 25 times the, the, the height and the width and the depth of our sun. So it is much, much larger. If it was in our uh, galaxy, or if it was our sun, instead of in place of our sun, it would be a huge thing if it up in the sky and it would crispy fry us immediately. It's a hundred times brighter than, than our sun. So as I said before, it's big and it's bright. And so it, that's why people picked it out of the night sky because it's a distinctive star that way. And Arcturus, it, it has an interesting quality to it. It is a runaway star. Uh, it, is a, it, it is moving through the galaxy very quickly. And that's why uh, the, that misalignment that we have now makes it possible for us to see these satellites. But way back in Job's time, it probably wouldn't have been possible, even if they had the optics, they, they couldn't have seen them because those satellites were more behind um, Arcturus. So, um, but Arcturus is a, is a runaway star and it's moving at 257 miles per second. And our sun is only moving at 12 and a half miles per second. And so big difference there. It's really scooting it through um, the galaxies. And, and so uh, this high velocity places Arcturus in a very small class of stars that are apparently a law unto themselves. It, it's a runaway and it just is doing what it wants to. And so the question that God asks about Arcturus is, can you guide Arcturus with her satellites? So God reveals a couple things that, that people couldn't have understood in Job's time. One is that they, it needs guiding because it's on a hustle through the star system and it has satellites. 
So very interesting stuff here and, and really gives us a foundation. Um, Job himself couldn't have known this stuff and God revealed it to him. So there is a God. We know that. We know that the Bible is true. So that gives us a, a real strong foundation to accept. And there are many such things in the Bible like that that can really give us that evidence that helps our, our faith to continue. So um, now we're going to switch gears a little bit here. Um, we've, we've talked about the, um, how people could question um, what Job says there and, and say it doesn't make any sense that Job would know these words or know that these um, uh, star clusters were in, in the, the, the night sky. But we've, we now understand how all of that can be. And it makes even more sense. In fact, it turns around to being God describing things that only we have come to know in this time. Um, and, and we are verified, therefore, that, that God is real. Job didn't make this stuff up himself. So, uh, but we're now looking at manuscript uh, errors. And, and there's a lot of talk by people about um, the, the Greek manuscripts and the errors in the, in the Greek manuscripts. And so I'm going to spend the rest of this study talking about that. And so, um, there, yes, there are a lot of manuscripts in Greek. Um, I, if I'm remembering correctly, I remember the number 10,000 being the number of separate pieces of manuscripts that, that they have found over time. But there's really only about 50 of them that most people work from. And, and even those 50 have quite a few differences between them. And, and some of these things we understand uh, being just copyist errors. Um, and, and so the copyist is the person who took an old fading copy that it was kind of worn out and, and he would take that and copy it to a new uh, parchment or papyrus, whatever he was writing on, and, and would um, trans transfer all of the words from one to the other. And uh, he would make mistakes sometimes, people make mistakes. Um, and I'll throw in a little bit more here. Um, what's different between the Hebrew manuscripts, which have very few of these errors, these kind of errors, um, and uh, the Greek manuscripts, well, actually, the, the Hebrew and the Aramaic are the same. In, in both of those, the translators developed lists of how many letters and how many words there should be in every verse of, of the Bible. And so when they were making a copy, once they had copied a verse, they could uh, check to see that it had the right number of words and had the right number of letters, and they would know that it was right. That never happened in, with any of the Greek manuscripts. Nobody ever kept track of that stuff. And, and so this it was a method that they used in the Hebrew and Aramaic uh, uh, Bibles um, to, to uh, find errors and get rid of errors early on. But because the Greeks didn't do that, a lot of errors have continued down to us. And, and so a copyist, one, a very natural thing to do for a copyist is to substitute a letter. So he's looking at an old original that's been faded and worn down. And he might see one letter and, and misunderstand that letter, and it looks like a different letter. And he puts that letter in in place because that letter works in a word that way. So sometimes words only differ by one letter. And, and so he sees a letter that looks like something else, and he says, well, it must be this, but he's wrong because he can't see it very well. And so that's a very typical thing that a copyist would do. And, and uh, dropping and, and substituting a word is another thing. Um, I saw this when I was learning drafting back as a young man. Uh, on those, in those days, we drafted by hand, uh, pen, pencil on paper, not in computers. Um, but uh, people who were draftsmen were trying to make all of the letters just right. And because of that, you would often drop a word or even drop a letter out of a word. And, and, um, and you wouldn't recognize that until you'd done it. And, and you wouldn't want to correct it because you just spent an hour doing that. And, and uh, so sometimes, um, these were released with spelling errors or missing words in them. And they're natural things to do. Um, as humans, we're fallible and we do that kind of thing. But another thing that you can also see that is maybe more, more surprising is dropping a whole clause out of a sentence or out of a verse. And so a clause is a group of like three or four words. And that can happen because you lose your place when you're copying things. So you've copied maybe the first five words and then you think, and maybe the, the fifth word repeats in that verse. And, and so you start, over with the repeat instead of where you had had started left off from and you drop off a section of the text and, and so that can happen and, and so you can drop out clauses that way if you aren't being careful and this is where that checking system from the Hebrew and Aramaic would do if you counted the number of words in a verse and the number of letters in a verse you would see right away that there's a problem uh, something's not adding up to what it should and so you would look at it again and, and check what you had done and you would see, oh man, I dropped this whole clause out. And, and you would have to go back and do it over. So 
Um, those are the kind of errors that copyists just make, humans make because we're fallible. And because they didn't use any kind of uh, error ca catching system, errors like that could get through and they did get through. But there's another kind of error that you see in the Greek manuscript is, is changes made by an editor. Now, an editor isn't just a copyist. He is making a copy, but he's also doing something in addition to that. He is what he's, he's doing is he thinks he's clarifying or correcting something in, in there. So he thinks he's making it better. And so he might make it better or clearer by substituting a word. He would say, well, this sentence makes more sense in our time, maybe, than then, or this word makes more sense in our time in this sentence. And so I'll use this word instead of the word that was originally there. And then he might also add a word or multiple words that, that help to make it clear uh, what, what he understands from the manuscript. Obviously, the, the risk there is um, if he doesn't understand it correctly, he could just introduce wrong ideas. And so he might add a word. He might even go so far as to add a clause um, and, and stick in a, whole, a few words, uh, three or four words that try to explain what was said there if he thinks it really wasn't clear in, in the original. And he might even go ahead and add a verse. There are some places where people think that verses were added um, to uh, the texts that we have. And, and one of our ways of confirming that is that there are some Greek manuscripts that have these errors and some that don't have these errors. And, and so because there are so many manuscripts, it, it helps us to see places where there are differences. And then we just have to sort out which one is the correct one. So, but it's important to understand in all of these, um, in almost all cases, there was never a significant change in doctrine going on. And, 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 and really, I, I think I would go so far as to say there never is a significant doctrinal change in these. These were all a person trying to clarify something or just copyist errors. And, and I'm gonna give you some examples that we're gonna look through here pretty quickly and, and see that. So here's a change that was wrong. Somebody put a change into uh, some of the manuscripts or it probably just into his manuscript and because he thought it was making it better and a bunch of people copied from his manuscript and now a lot of manuscripts have this. And so this one comes from Manus, Ma Matthew 27 verse nine. And it says, then that which was spoken through Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled and they took the 30 pieces of silver, the price of the one whose price had been set by the sons of Israel. Okay, um, Jeremiah the prophet did not say that. That's coming from Zechariah. It is actually an error. And, and there are people who are trying to say, no, if you think of it this way, Jeremiah makes sense, but it really doesn't. And they're, they're trying to stretch it and, and patch it over with uh, rethinking. But, but it really isn't that. It is a mistake. Um, and and you, you can't rationalize it that way. It doesn't make any sense to do that. And so what happened here? Um, we can tell because there are a small number of manuscripts that, that say only the words, the prophet. Jeremiah isn't in there. And so somebody at some point added the word Jeremiah, thinking that it was from Jeremiah, but he didn't check that, and it's actually from Zechariah. And, and so um, he, he was probably well-intentioned, um, but he was wrong. And, and uh, so somewhere someone decided that to do that, but he got it wrong. And, and just because of who he was, perhaps, or where he was, far more copies of his manuscript were made than others. And so there's just a few of them that say only the words, the prophet. They don't say Jeremiah, the prophet. And, and so he only added one word. He meant well, but he was wrong. And, and here's another one. Here's an incorrect quote from the Old Testament. This is um, the New Testament quoting um, words from the Old Testament, but getting it wrong. And so um, this comes from Ephesians 4, 8, quoting Psalms 68, 18. And so we'll look at this in a couple different translations. So it, it says uh, from NIV, this is why it says, when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. Okay, that's the NIV's translation of the Greek. Um, and the NIV Greek for, in the Old Testament, Psalm 68, 18 says, when you ascended on high, you took many captives, you received gifts from people. So right away, we see there's something different here. We've got give gifts and we have received gifts. And so what NIV has done here is, um, they've um, uh, just let it go. They said, well, the Hebrew says received, the, the Greek says gave, uh, at least in our understanding of it, and we're just gonna leave it that way and we're not gonna mess with it. But it turns out that they've done something else here. These two took many captives. It's the same in both of these from the NIV, but there are other translations that, that say something different. And this one comes from um, 
Young's, um, Young's translation. And, and it says, uh, Young's literal translation, this is what it is. And he says, now this is Gothic English, thou hast ascended on high, thou hast taken captive captivity, thou hast taken gifts for men. So he has it uh, uh, differently too. So um, what's happened here is uh, in Hebrew, um, it says, take, take the, the best translation of Hebrew would say what the literal translation here says, taken captive captivity. But NIV sees this in the New Testament, and so they're changing the Old Testament translation to this from what it should be here because it doesn't line up. So the Old Testament doesn't line up with the NIV translation, either in the yellow or in the blue. So those differences there is a misquote. Um, somebody quoted that wrong and, and, or changed it and, and did something wrong. It's hard to tell on this one exactly what happened. But, but somehow the New Testament is different there. Now, is it a significant difference? No, it isn't a significant difference, but it's, it's a kind of difference that people can cause to happen if they're doing that. So um, now changed words. Um, this is another thing that you see quite a bit of is a uh, different word is being used between different Greek manuscripts. And, and the first one we'll look at is from Matthew 23, 25. And we'll look at the Greek. I know you don't understand that. I'm just gonna point out in yellow here that the difference that's in them. And, and um, what this verse is, you'll probably recognize it, is it's, it ends by saying, or it nearly ends by saying, but within are full of plunder and something, okay? And so um, in one set of manuscripts, you'll see this. In one set of manuscripts, you'll see this. And you can tell just visually that they're different words, although you don't know the words. Um, but the words turn out to be in the first one, the word for laziness, and in the second, the word for injustice. So they're, they're hugely different words. Um, they don't have the same meaning at all. Um, and, and again, is this a critical difference? No, this is not a critical difference. Um, this is just um, a point. And, and generally in most of these, if you read the context of the whole verse, you'll understand the real point and you'll be able to correct for um, what is a wrong word in these translations. So context, I've mentioned context many times, very important for context. And, and so, um, but nonetheless, there's this dif difference between the Greek manuscripts. And, uh, and in fact, uh, in this one, if you got all of those like 50 Greek manuscripts together, you would find that there are seven different words that were used in here. So, so people were having trouble with the original word and a lot of them were putting in a different word um, that made more sense to them. And so this is kind of a case where there were a lot of people doing the same thing in their manuscripts. And so there are lots of manuscripts that are different in different ways. Okay, now here's a, a, a really big one. In this one, there's um, changed words, there are added words, and there are moved words. And, and, and so these, these names that you see here are the names of the, the Greek um, variant that's been found. So a, a Greek manuscript, one of them is called Westcart and Hort. And, and this one is called the Byzantine Majority Text. And, and you'll see those names if you ever go digging into Bible texts. Um, they're, they're, they're quite common among that 50 standard. And so in here, what I've done is I've used yellow to show a changed word. So it's just different between these two manuscripts. Blue is marking out words that were added and green is, is words that were moved. So in here, this word is this word over here. So somebody chose an entirely different word because that made sense to them. And, and over here we see this word, but it's now moved over here. See that it, it is this word and then this word. And now we see this one down here followed by that word. Okay, so the order of those two, word, two words has been changed. And, and over here in the blue, this is a, a word that's just been added. You can see the same word here and here, followed by a comma, followed by that word in a comma. So this word is, is new in this manuscript here. And, and again, the same thing happens over here. Um, another word has been added in here. And so somebody has done a lot of changes here um, to make this I'm sure they're making it clearer. They think it, they're making it clearer anyway, but they're making it different. And, and our problem here is that it's difficult for us to tell which one is the original. Um, we, we only have these two. Um, we can't say that this one is the original. There's, there's no reason to believe that it is, and we can't say this one is the original. So we're just kind of stuck. We, we say there's a difference and we don't know how it came about or, and what's the original. Continuing on with that one, um, that's actually James 2.18. Um, and I, what I did was I took those exact Greek words and I pasted them into Google Translate and translated them from the Greek to get you this. And, and what I've learned about Google Translate might be worth remembering 
it cheats sometimes. And sometimes instead of doing a translation, it will look up a translation that it knows about and give you that. And, and um, I actually stumbled that in, into that in, in one of these cases. And, and so what you have to do is you have to force uh, it by uh, cutting down the text a little bit so it doesn't look like the original that it's going back to and, and make it do the translation itself. And that's what I did here to, to force it to come out with translating just what's in those Greek that you see there. So, um, so those, the two uh, verses come out in different, those two different uh, manuscripts this way in English. It says, but you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without works, then I will show you faith from my works. Okay, and, and that is a very common thing that you'll see in the Bible. Uh, but there are other Bibles that, that use this phrase, this translation, and it's different in meaning. But you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith by your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. So that's a really different concept that's being expressed there. But, but somebody at some point said, no, this is, this is what Paul really means here, or James means. And, and, um, and so um, I'm going to change these words to make it clearer. Um, and, and so they make distinctly different points. Neither one is wrong. They're, they're both right things that you could say. Um, but one of them is original and the other one isn't, and we don't know which is. And, and, and so, so both could be perfectly true, are perfectly true. There's no theological problem in either one of them. It's just a matter of what is it that was originally said by James. And so again, we see changes that people have made um, that aren't theologically important. Um, they, they don't have any changes like that that would cause you to doubt the validity of the Bible. And there isn't any scoundrel at work here. Uh, but that isn't always true. There definitely have been times when there were scoundrels at work. And, and there are people who've been made changes, who have made changes with evil intent. And we've talked about this one uh, before, and I won't spend any length of time on it. But this is the Lord's Day and the Lord's Supper. Um, someone added those phrases, um, and I won't even read those verses. So uh, these phrases were not in use by people at the, at the time these Revelation and 1 Corinthians were written. Uh, they didn't come into use until a few hundred years later. And, and so someone took those phrases and, and put them into here because they were trying to achieve something. And, and the reason we know that is um, the Aramaic Bibles, um, which were used by the Eastern churches, the Greek uh, Bibles were used by the Western church, Aramaic by the Eastern church. The Aramaic Bibles do not have this change. Uh, the change was only made in the Greek Bibles. So somebody in the Western church decided um, to, to make these changes and, and they forced all the translators to make these changes. So um, someone changed it um, because, and the only reason you can come up with when you look at these changes, and, and look at what was happening at those times is that they changed them to justify the moves that they, they had made to the dates of the Sabbath, moving Sabbath to Sunday and Passover. And, and so, and, and also what's kind of interesting about it is there's only one change for each. Um, the, this, the Lord's Day and the Lord's Supper each only appear once in the New Testament. So somebody just did it once. And, and from that point on, they could say, well, Lord's Day is in the Bible. Just look at it. It's right there. And, and so, um, what they were doing was they were attaching Jesus' name to their change. And, and so they're saying, it's the Lord's day, so you definitely have to um, uh, keep that day holy. Um, and, and, um, and so that's how they were justifying that. And that shouldn't be a surprise because COG-7 itself has done the same thing with their Sabbath change. They've attached it to Jesus' death. And, and they basically say, well, Jesus' death was so terrible that something must have happened that would have canceled the Sabbath. And, and, um, and so that's how they've, they've done the same kind of a change is that. And it's a, a common thing to do is to try to, to get you um, to think that this is something that the Bible endorsed. So I, I didn't want to spend a lot of time on that because I've covered it all before. So I if I could comment, as, yep. as you and I know, the uh, COP7 has already changed uh, something to do with the Sabbath in that they don't keep the Sabbath, but celebrate it. Yeah. And to me, they, that opens a Pandora's box because that just means that we can celebrate different ways. We don't have to go to church. We can go shopping. We can go to a, a movie or something or other. So yeah. that, that's just a bit of a slippery slope they put us into. Yes, that's absolutely true. Um, uh, those two words are quite different. When you keep something, um, how do you keep it? Well, the Bible tells you how to keep it. But if you celebrate something, well, nothing tells you how to celebrate it. So you're entirely open to your own interpretation of what it would be to celebrate the Sabbath. And, and yeah, that's what you're saying. That's right. So summarizing all of what I've said here, and then I'm done. Um, there are lots of changes in all of the manuscripts that we have in Greek. Um, they're mostly 
copyist errors, accidental errors that, that um, weren't caught by the person who was making the copy, and, um, and that they're obvious because often they are dropped words and dropped phrases and things like that. And we can compare them to other manuscripts and, and see what happened there. And, and, but the, the remainder of the changes that, that are in all of these manuscripts um, are intentional changes. Uh, they were mostly attempting to clarify something to make it easier to understand or, or to make it possible for the reader to grasp better what was being said. And, and so they had good intentions. Um, they, they didn't mean to change anything uh, theologically, anything important. Um, they were just trying to clarify, but as we saw in that one example, the clarification was just wrong. And, and so these things really shouldn't have happened. Um, people shouldn't have been doing that, but, but they were nonetheless. And we, we saw that there are changes that were made with evil intent, but there are, those are very few. Um, um, people were uh, really pretty careful about uh, not changing anything meaningful in the Bible. They, they knew they were believers and, and they believed that um, this was God's word. And so primarily they, they didn't make big changes like that. But the Roman Catholic Church, by the time that those two were the, the Lord's Day and the Lord's uh, Supper, when those changes were made, um, had become somewhat evil uh, even at, by that time and was doing some things it shouldn't have been doing. And so, um, but in summary, we can say about all these changes that the Bible is not corrupted by any of these changes that were made. In many cases, we can catch the change and figure it out. Um, even when we can't, it's not a theological problem. It doesn't cause us to have some different idea of who God is or what God does or how he acts. Nothing like that is ever affected by these changes. Um, and so taking it right back to our original question, is the Bible trustworthy? And, and um, yes, it is, um, despite these changes. But in the end, it comes down to faith. Um, you can look at all those changes in the Bible and see it as a reason to not have faith. Or you can look at those changes and say that it doesn't affect my faith. And, and so it really comes down to faith. And, and that's what God would have it be. Um, we, the proof does not exist that the Bible is God's word. The, the Bible says it's God's word. But if you don't believe there's a God, then you don't believe it's the Bible is his word. And so you wouldn't believe a statement in the Bible that said it's God's word. And, and so um, you, it's, to a person who has faith, um, you don't need the proof. Um, you, you see in other things in the Bible what little proof you need to support the faith that you have. And so uh, it's not um, a big problem for us if somebody says uh, all of these things about the Bible. Um, and so it really comes down to if you don't trust God, then the Bible was just written by men who can't be trusted. But if you do trust God, then it is God's word and it is trustable. Any questions, comments? Okay, one more last summary. I've forgotten about this slide. Um, our faith is not without fact. Um, there are lots of facts. We saw the one about the stars that we started with. And, and God gives us an understanding that just couldn't have been known to Job, the author. Um, and, and, um, but we have in our time the ability to understand that. So there are lots of things in the Bible that um, give us the reason to believe, gives us some facts on which to base, base our faith. But our, our faith doesn't need facts. But nonetheless, there are facts for us. And, and many times uh, biblical accounts have uh, bits of history that have been proven true when people didn't think they were true. Um, and uh, next week, I expect I'll be talking about some more things like that. Um, and, and also fulfilled prophecy is a big one. All of those fulfilled prophecies about Jesus and who he was, when you look back at, at all of those things, there's a massive amount of that stuff. And, and it isn't possible that the, the Bible could have just been written by a few people at a particular time, as some people claim. So all of these things do give us facts on which to base our faith. 